And tis a beautiful home of the soul. Built by Jesus on high, there we never shall die. Tis a land where we'll never grow old. Never grow old, never grow old. In a land where I'll never grow old. Never grow old, never grow old. In a land where we'll never grow old. Number two. In that beautiful home where we'll never more roam, we shall be in the sweet by and by. Happy praise to the King, through eternity sing, tis a land where we'll never shall die. Never grow old, never grow old, in a land where we'll never grow old. Never grow old, never grow old, in a land where we'll never grow old. Number three, when our work here is done, and the life crown is won, and our troubles and trials are o'er. All our sorrow will end, and our voices will blend with the loved ones who've gone on before. Never grow old, never grow old, in a land where we'll never And ushers, you can make your way forward. We do have uh, some visitors here with tonight, and I'm going to let Pastor Dave introduce his visitors to us. Pastor Dave? Well, tonight with us, we have um, my stepmom, Carrie, and my dad, Danny, um, all the way out from L.A., from L.A. area. This morning, my nephew, Kyle, and uh, niece, Katie, were also here. Very good. Very good. In L.A., let me just make sure you understand, that's not lower Alabama. That's Los Angeles, so I just want to make sure we clarify that up. But thank you for being here tonight, and if you haven't already gotten a gift uh, book there from us, that's to you. That's actually authored by your pastor, so uh, you get a book there from your pastor, and then um, a connection card, and uh, you can uh, fill that out for us. Thank you very much. Glad you're uh, here with us tonight. And so at this time, we'll have our choir come and sing for us.
Bible says, um, we all strive, but yet one receiveth the prize. A couple weeks ago, we had the Harvest Festival, and at the Harvest Festival, we had our annual dessert contest. So tonight, I want to present the first, um, announce the first place winner. Uh, just so people know, it's not just my decision, otherwise Kiara would have won, right? <laughs> um, I had a, a seven judges there, and um, together they voted. So for 2017, for the dessert contest, getting a $25 gift certificate to Starbucks to go along with their dessert, this year was Mrs. Giserni. Let's give her a hand. I just wanted to bring an announcement for the teen activity tonight. I apologize to the teens that came for pumpkin ice cream. We will have eggnog ice cream and pumpkin swirl. So I apologize, no pumpkin ice cream. They did not sell it. So uh, pumpkin swirl though, if you tried it from BJ's, it's the best. You won't, uh, you won't be disappointed if you come tonight. So teenagers, be aware immediately after the service. All right, before uh, we go on with the next song, there's a testimony I wanted to share. We could call it, I guess, an outreach report of sorts. And this is just to kind of pull back the curtain and show you what happens on Tuesday nights and just how exciting things are uh, for us. This, um, uh, this past Tuesday, we had just a whole team of people to make the whole event happen. And so um, let's back up even a few months ago. Uh, Angela and uh, one of her partners, uh, she hates when I use her name, so I'm sorry. Okay, don't, don't beat me up later for that. Uh, they were out uh, going uh, door to door, at, uh, soul winning, visiting, and they met Elaine sitting down here who just slipped in. I was planning on telling this not knowing you all were going to be here, so you just have to sit and endure it, okay? But I uh, met Elaine out and uh, invited Elaine, and Elaine came and brought her grandchildren to Neighborhood Bible Time, and that was their first exposure to our church. Many of you ladies were very kind to Elaine in the lobby. She were, uh, comment on that later. And uh, Elaine has come several times since then. And so um, Angela had noticed that uh, some things were going on in Elaine's life. She wasn't able to be here. So Tuesday night, uh, some of our ladies went back by. And let me just explain what happens on Tuesday nights to make that work. We had a couple of ladies sitting down here, the Verone ladies, they made dinner Tuesday night. And so you all get a part of the uh, part of this. It's, it's just part of the team of making this happen. Mrs. Rivera down here at the piano, she watched the nursery. So uh, uh, that could happen. And then, um, so much work and prep went into this. And so, uh, uh, some of our ladies went out and, uh, went and followed up on Elaine and Elaine came today with her son, Scott, Scott, raise your hand there for me. So everyone sees who you are. Scott's 16 years old. Scott's actually had two of our ladies who are in our church. who have had him in classes in their school, if I believe so. Uh, but he, he came today and at the end of the service, uh, Scott bowed his head and trusted Christ as his Savior. And so we're just thrilled with that, with that decision. For those of you that prepare a meal on Tuesday night, watch the nursery on Tuesday night, um, I don't think Scott today would have gotten saved if you hadn't done your part. And so thank you. It matters. It matters. You say, well, I'm not comfortable sharing my faith. You can do something. You can do something. Listen, uh, uh, the, the Verone ladies and, and Rachel and everyone who's involved in making a, a part of our meal schedule or our team, you all get a part of, of that. And uh, it, listen, it was much more involved in that to his salvation today, but thank you for doing your part, making that work. Your labor is not in vain. And we need, need more help in these areas with making visits, with preparing the food, with watching the kids. And so if you can help and you want in on the eternal dividends, I would encourage you to see Pastor Mike with those things. I wanted to share that with the church and I, I thought that was neat. Pastor, or rather, Brother Verone, if you'd come and lead us in our next song. And may I ask you a prayer request for my mom? All right, uh, so I just uh, took a call there. My, my mom wasn't doing well today. I, I don't know if you noticed that, many of you. Um, by the time we got her back to the home, her, uh, her blood count was down to like 82. Um, and if you know what that means, it means her oxygen to her brain was not uh, sufficient as what it should be. Normally your pulse ox should be around, or your box, the oxygen level should be around 97, 98. Uh, and so uh, they had to put her on oxygen today and she just was not doing well. Um, and so I just got a call as pastor was up. So I took that call, if you wonder why I stepped away. And so they're doing some special things for her tonight. They're gonna watch her through the evening. Uh, and so if you could just remember to pray for my mom, she's just not doing very well right now. Hopefully she'll be okay. Um, uh, but this is a you know, little, little crisis for her, not a big one, little one but please pray for her, all right? Thank you so much. 
All right, let's, uh, let's um, open our hymnals to hymn fi- uh, 455, My Jesus, I Love Thee. 455, we'll do the first and the fourth. Let's all stand together, please. <clears throat> My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all of follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now number four. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. Sing with a glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. You may be seated. I'll search if you would make your way forward for the uh, collection of the offering this evening. Just as a reminder, there are many uh, important events and activities coming up in the bulletin. Uh, please read them. We don't print them out so you can just toss them. We print them out so you can read them. So be aware of all the announcements in the bulletin, please. If I could have uh, David Greer pray for this uh, evening's offering. Thank you, Lord God, for bringing us together. Let's say to you, Lord, thank you uh, for the, the church body. Lord, as those uh, couldn't make it up tonight, Let's take our hymnals again, if we would. Turn to hymn 485. Hymn 485, we'll sing the first and the third, or first and the last. Hymn 485, Have Thine Own Way. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the After thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. Number three, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal. Savior divine. Amen. All right, Proverbs chapter 6 in your Bibles.
Just a reminder that at the end of the service tonight, we will be taking up an offering for Miss Rose Pacenti and the loss of her daughter. I will say more about that in a little bit. And teenagers, I'd really encourage you to go upstairs tonight and enjoy the uh, pumpkin roll and the eggnog ice cream. Is it too early for eggnog yet? It's never too early for eggnog. How many of you, eggnog's a very polarizing thing. How many of you hate eggnog, just hate it? Unbelievable. How many of you love eggnog? Eggnog is great. So I side with the ones that are raising their hands second. Proverbs chapter 6 tonight. Um, if we were to make your list of six things that you hate, eggnog might make the list, right? Uh, Rose is saying absolutely yes. And those that uh, don't like it don't understand how anybody else could. I was uh, up in Vermont uh, Wednesday through uh, Saturday and uh, I went to the gro- I went grocery shopping to get some things. Um, Brother uh, Chippio sent me up with a couple of T-bone steaks. They have a grill up there, so I grilled those, and I didn't die yet of food poisoning, feeding myself. I'm not much of a cook. Uh, but one of the things I bought at the grocery store was eggnog. So I saw it for sale. I said, oh, yeah, i got to get it. So fire in the fireplace, I had my feet up and eggnog in my hand, and I was a very happy, happy pastor. Proverbs 6, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. This evening, we're going to look at our fourth installment of this series. A couple of these in the list are repetitive, and so God puts them in there for emphasis' sake. Uh, I will not preach them uh, the same uh, topics again, so we've got a couple of more sermons after this. Uh, We've got um, a false witness that spreadeth lies, feet that run to mischief, and Uh, possibly he that soweth discord among the brethren. Let's look here at verse 16. The Bible says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Tonight we're going to look at this topic, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Let's pray. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to clear our minds of the clutter, distractions, Lord, the to-do lists, uh, uh, work tomorrow, all the various uh, items that uh, loom over us. Help us to be able to mentally push all that out for just a few minutes and allow your word to speak to us and the truths of your word, to, uh, to, Lord, to help us be better Christians that uh, understand you and follow you uh, in a way that uh, is appropriate and pleasing. I think of the disciples that followed you for three years three and a half years, and Lord, at the end, some of the things they were saying and doing just seemed so foolish, but God, ultimately, they got it. Lord, we're following you. Lord, sometimes the things we say and do sound foolish, seem foolish, are foolish, but Lord, I pray that we'll get it. May we get the truths tonight. May this truth hammer home to us and lodge in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. We took a couple of week break from uh, talking about the command, uh, while talking about rather the commandments of Christ, the last two Sundays, uh, Sunday evenings. Tonight we'll jump right back in here to Proverbs six and uh, continue our series of the sins on God's hate list. Let me share a paradox with you. I mentioned this this morning. My heart's desire is to present to you the sins that God hates, but to do so in a loving tone. In a loving tone. I'm not here to to uh, uh, sound hateful or mean or ugly, but uh, these are the sins that God just hates. A little bit extra. I talked about in the first sermon I preached how that this is likened to a uh, school rule book where you've got talking maybe is two demerits and uh, forgetting your homework is five demerits, but that back page of the rule book having a list of rules for which you're automatically expelled from school. You're thrown out for violating these even the first time. God's not going to kick you out of his family, but you uh, become uh, uh, you become a putrid to God. You become abominable to God. These six things are an abomination, or rather these seven are an abomination to him. And so these are those sins that you really want to try to steer clear of. And you want to try to stay far, far away from these. And so my purpose tonight is not to badger you. My purpose is to lovingly warn you and to uh, remind you that, hey, listen, these are things that can creep up on all of us, on all of us. Uh, We started the series by talking about a 
proud look. Now, uh, pride is one thing, but when it goes from having a proud moment or a proud day here and there, and it begins to become where the very look on your face is pride. The very push uh, in your life is pride. That that snooty, arrogant, uh, nose-in-the-air attitude. I heard someone say one time that if your nose is sticking up any higher, if it were to rain, you would drown. You would drown. And uh, that is, uh, that's the look that we're talking about, that proud look that I'm better than you. My nose is in the air. And Listen, uh, having a proud moment where you confess it is one thing, but uh, that being unleft with leads to a heart of pride where it even begins to become evidenced on the very face. You're very face on a regular basis. A proud look. Next, we talked about a lot here in our very lands and abortion clinics all over the country. I'll not rehash that tonight. Tonight, we will look at the next one on the list, and number four on the list is in heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Now, by way of introduction, let me share this with you. Uh, this, is, this was an interesting uh, find for me studying for this. You find the words imagine, imagined, or imaginations in the Bible 35 times, both Old and New Testament, 35 times. Now, twice uh, this wor- these words are used in a prayer by David on his deathbed. Okay, one of those times David talks about uh, the idea of imagining in a neutral manner. The other time he talks about it as a hypothetical positive, a hypothetical positive. So uh, you have the two times David uses it at the end of his life on his deathbed. The word is used outside of that 33 times. And in all 33 instances, it's used in a negative way every time single time. It's used as, uh, described as deceit, or uh, most often it's used to describe as evil. Other times it's used to talk about wicked imaginations, but all other 33 times you find the, these words, imagine, imagined, imagination, imaginations, you find them being mentioned in a negative light. Now, why is that? Why is that? Because God knows that in our imaginations, very, very bad things Uh, can begin there that end even more wicked when they're played out and portrayed. I believe, and don't miss this, we're going to hit this at the end of the sermon, I believe that if you can cleanse who you are within, then you can maintain that cleansed heart. Uh, Then you can use the force of your imagination to devise good and accomplish much for God's work. If you don't clean up your heart and you don't walk guard around your heart, and evil exists in your heart, sin remains in your heart, then that becomes a playground for Satan to begin to allow you to imagine some very bad things, and you can end up doing some very, very wicked things. Tonight, we're going to look at five perspectives about our imaginations, and then we'll look at three concluding thoughts. So five perspectives and three concluding thoughts. I don't believe, let me glance through my notes here, I don't believe I have... Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, point four has some subpoints. We'll blow the blow through those quickly. So five quick points. One point's got some subpoints, and then three concluding thoughts, and then we'll get out of here. So let's jump right into them tonight. Number one, first known as the seat, the seat of our imaginations. Take your Bibles back over to Genesis chapter six. Genesis chapter six. Those of you that know your Bible well uh, would not at all be surprised that I'd be going here. Genesis chapter six, verse number five. Here we find uh, uh, Noah, God getting ready to destroy the earth of the flood. And uh, Noah is the last good man left, Noah and his family. And the Bible says this about uh, the world around Noah. And i got to say, we're a long ways off from this. At least I hope we're a long ways off from this. Verse 5 says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every imagination, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So God's looking down into the brains of all the people on planet earth at the time. He's looking at their thoughts. He's looking at not only their thoughts, but their imaginations. And they are two different things. And he says, wow, every imagination in everybody's head is evil. Every single person. Now, where do these imaginations sit? Notice it says there, imaginations of the thoughts of his heart. The imagination, the seat of your imaginations is your heart. Well, more about that in a minute. Turn over to Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. Now, the flood has happened. Noah and his 
and Mrs. Noah and then his three sons and uh, their wives all get off the boat, the eight of them, and uh, the, uh, 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 the Lord is smelling the savor of the offering that's being made underneath the rainbow there of Noah, and he says this, the Bible says in verse 21, the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Now, notice that imagination of man's heart. That's the seat or the origin of our imagination. Where our imagination gets its ideas from is from the heart. And the Bible says that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So here God promises under the rainbow to never send a flood to destroy man again. But the point I'm trying to draw out of this verse is that the imagination gets its ideas from the heart, from the heart. Now that's key to understanding the whole sermon tonight, okay? Let's talk more about that. The shaping, number two, notice the shaping of our imagination. The shaping of our imagination. Now, uh, Je Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 is a verse that we've all heard many times that go to church. It says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. And you, you've heard this verse explained, and so I'll spare you some of that, but let me just uh, hop in here and say this, is that when you say about someone they have a good heart, that is a false statement. All right? Uh, your pastor does not have a good heart. You do not have a good heart. You do not have a good heart. Jeremiah said that your heart is deceitful. Remember this morning we talked about how that you got on your knees and you asked God to fill you with the Spirit and let the Spirit run your heart and life and emotions and all those things and five minutes later you're blowing your stack with somebody? You know why? Because your heart's deceitful. You think you got it all under control. You think you got it all turned over to the Lord and then you turn around and you find out that your heart has deceived you. Not only is it deceitful, but it is desperately wicked. Not just wicked, desperately wicked. You look at some of the crimes that are committed in our world. You like me, you ever shake your head and say, how does someone ever get to a place where they can do that? How horrible. How awful. Can I tell you this evening that every one of us is capable of doing any sin any sin, if left to your base state, all of us, all of us. You say, well, the sin I'm dabbling in is not that bad. Listen, it's going to lead to worse and to worse and to worse. Now, what makes our hearts deceitful and desperately wicked? I have a list here. They're not going to be on the screen, but I have a list here of things. And I would encourage you to write these down and study them later if you are looking for something to study in your Bible. Um, this would be a good study for you. What makes the heart deceitful and desperately wicked? I wrote these five things down, and I'm sure this list is not exhaustive. There are probably more things, but I wrote down first our sin nature. Now, that's the most obvious one, but our sin nature. You, um, in your heart, you are a sinner by your nature. Your heart is naturally sinful because you have sinful blood uh, piping through it, flowing through it. Excuse me there. The second thing I wrote down is our sin habits. Now, let me uh, make sure I clarify this, is that you're going to be plagued by your sin nature for the rest of your life. It does not matter whether or not you have sinful habits. You're going to be plagued by your sin nature. You may not be a habitual liar, but you are probably still going to tell a lie from time to time. Right? You may not be a habitual, uh, you may not be a, a, a habitual uh, abusive of language. Your, your language may be mostly edifying, but that doesn't mean you're not capable of spreading a critical word here or there. You're going to sin to the day you die. There is a difference between having a sin nature and allowing sinful habits to take over. Now, um, I'm gonna, I, I, want you to, I want you to get this. I really want you to get this. I do believe it is possible for a Christian to get to a point in his life where he has kicked sinful habits, all of them, but has not yet overcome his sinful nature. You're here tonight and you say, well, yeah, I've got a sinful habit. I, I do this, or I talk this way, or I, I smoke this, I drink this, I act this way, and uh, uh, I've got this indulgence in the corner no one knows about it. But big deal, because everybody has something. 
Oh, that's a lie Satan wants you to believe, that everybody has a sinful habit, so you're no different than everybody else. My friend, everybody else is not the standard. And you are not going to overcome your sinful nature, but you can overcome sinful habits. You absolutely can. Do not let Satan feed you that bill of lies. The third thing I have down here that makes the heart deceitful and desperately wicked is unconfessed sins. Unconfessed sins. Now, Pastor Pezlak used to say this often, and it's something I will continue to say often, and that is keep a short list with God. Keep a short list with God. Uh, get down on your knees and tell God you're sorry. The beautiful thing is that when you got saved, your eternal record, all of the sins of your life, both past, present, and future, were blotted out. Every one of them. God doesn't see them. There's no record of them. Uh, there's, uh, there is an ink blot over each one of them, and, and they are wiped off your record. They're not there. And so when it comes to your eternality of your sin, uh, God does not see it. But can I say that when it comes to your role of father and child, father, son, father, daughter, He knows about your sins until you confess them. I put it to you this way, whenever you get saved, sonship with God can never be broken. The truth is Matthew here could grow up and uh, rob a bank and uh, 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 kill someone in the process and fly to Africa and change his name and totally disown me. Sonship would still not be broken. He's still my son. You cannot, God, you and God cannot get a divorce. He will always be your eternal father if you put your faith in him. But, but, but kinship... Fellowship can be broken. Rather, not kinship. Fellowship can be broken. I guarantee you, Matthew, you grow up and do that. Our relationship's over, buddy. Don't do that. All right? Your fellowship with God is broken when there's unconfessed sin. Why is it that your heart is so deceitful and so desperately wicked? Could it be that you have years and years and years of unconfessed sin that you've not dealt with? You've not dealt with. That unconfessed sin. That unconfessed sin. Uh, for some of you, it would be a very good idea for you to fall down on your knees and tell God you're sorry for sins in your past. You say, well, pastor, does that mean I've got to remember every sin I've committed? It does not mean that. Um, oftentimes, I'll get down on my knees when I pray, and, and I'll list off the sins that I've committed. And I'm brutally honest with God about my sin. I go into detail with Him about my sin because I want myself to see how wicked I was, how sinful I was. And after I have taken inventory and I've confessed my sins, I'll generally pray a prayer like this. I'll say, Lord, there are probably sins I committed. I'm not even aware that they are sin. There are probably sins I've committed that I've forgotten about. And my heart is that of repentance. Will you please forgive me? You need to come to that place regularly with God where you confess that sin. How about this? The reasons why our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. How about uh, uh, past hurts and offenses left unforgiven? Past hurts and offenses left unforgiven. Somebody in here tonight, probably several somebodies in here tonight, has had somebody hurt them deeply, and truth is you still haven't let that go. You haven't let that go. Maybe it was a parent that left when you were young left you devastated. Maybe it was uh, a boss who fired you unfairly. Maybe it was um, uh, uh, somebody uh, uh, took advantage of you and cursed you out uh, or, or uh, be, besmirged you on social media and made you look awful in front of everybody. No telling what the offense is. It was wrong. It was out of bounds. It hurt. It hurt you deep and you haven't let go of it. Your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And you say, Pastor, why are you spending so much time on the heart? Because, again, the heart is the origin of the imaginations. And if our imaginations are, uh, uh, God hates uh, wicked imaginations, we buy, we've got to get our heart cleaned up. We've got to get our heart figured out. We've got to figure out why it is that our heart keeps deceiving us and why our heart remains desperately wicked. And so we see tonight that our sin nature, our sin habits, unconfessed sins, past sins that have uh, gone left undealt with, past hurts and offenses left unforgiven. If you leave these things here, then your heart uh, can very easily create imaginations that are wicked. Now, uh, the, these, uh, these things make up the darkness of our hearts. They make up the darkness of our hearts. Those dark corners that you, you, you want to pretend as though they're not there, and you deceive yourself that they're not there, and uh, that's why it's deceitful, and that's how it can remain desperately wicked. Now, interestingly enough, the root word, the root Hebrew word for imagination is the same root word translated twice in your Old Testament as the word 
frame. Frame. Now, you look at point number two, you see there is the shaping or the framing of our imaginations. Twice in the Old Testament, the same word in Genesis 6, 5 for imagination is translated as the word frame. Psalm 103, 14 says, For he knoweth our frame or our imaginations. He remembereth that we our we are dust. We are dust. So uh, here is one of those instances where I think that maybe our English Bible helps us to better understand the Hebrew text. Because here we get two different words in the Hebrew. It's the same word. He knoweth our frame, our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. Can you flip over to Isaiah chapter 29 for me? Isaiah chapter 29. We'll see the other instance where the word frame is used here. And it's a very interesting uh, concept because I think that the word picture that's given to us here can help us understand how our imaginations are formed uh, in that uh, uh, God uses another illustration here. Now look at verse 16 of Isaiah 29. It sits there with that clay. He, he With his imagination, he forms the clay. Now, I want you to replace the mind of the potter for your heart. And that clay for your imaginations. As your heart goes, so your imagination is framed. If your heart is wicked, then your imaginations will shape up to be wicked. If your heart is impure, then you're going to imagine things in your mind that are impure. Number three, we see the secrecy of our imaginations. Proverbs chapter 12 in your Bibles. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 20. I hope you, you'll turn and look at, the, look at this because it's not my preaching that's going to change you. It's God's Word that will change you. So let God's Word speak to you. And we use the Bible a lot here. We're, we're not deeper lifer Christians, all right? We're not deeper lifer Christians. But what we are trying to be is biblicists here. So we want God's Word to speak to us so we understand it better. Look at verse 20 there of Hebrews 12, or rather Proverbs 12. It says, Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but the counselors of peace is joy. Notice that. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. So they are deceiving themselves. You see this word deceit show up a couple of different places in regards to the imagination. We'll look at that a little bit more close here in a minute. But oh, the point I'm trying to make out here is that you are the worst version of yourself in the imagination of your heart. Why? Because no one else travels there. No one else travels there. The things that you imagine, no one else knows. Secret. Secret. You, uh, you lay in bed at night and your imagination works as you're falling asleep. By the way, on some level, your subconscious makes up what your imagination is. When you dream, that is your subconscious coming alive. You say, well, I don't ever dream. You dream, you just don't always remember uh, that you dream. For my study of dreams, uh, if you wake up in the middle of a, uh, of a scary dream or a, a uh, 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 what's the word here, a uh, emotional dream, you remember it. Otherwise, you don't remember them. If they begin and end while you're asleep, you don't usually have any recollection much of it there. Uh, uh, but the point I'm getting here is that the, you, you are the worst version of yourself in the imagination of your heart. If your dreams are, are raunchy, if your dreams are dirty, if your dreams are wicked, if you fall asleep at nighttime thinking about things, fantasizing about things that aren't right, if you walk around during the day and you think things that aren't good, you say, Pastor, are you talking about dirty old men that sit on the bench at the mall and look at uh, girls and they walk by? No, I'm talking about much more than that. I'm talking about imagination that thinks bad about people who you don't like and complains constantly in your head about uh, 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 things and, and your, your imaginary thoughts are that which do not please Christ. Christ. It's, it's a secret place. Listen, the preacher's not going to know what you think unless you tell him. Your Sunday school teacher's not going to know. Your spouse isn't going to know. Your children aren't going to know. But God in heaven knows. And we think that because no one else knows. We can think whatever we want and it's okay. Satan feeds us this lie that our imagination is a safe haven for our sin. It's a safe haven. It's a safe haven for our sin. All right, let me encourage you to write this down as well. There are two types of imaginary thoughts. Two types. Here they are. Ready? You have verbal imaginary thoughts and you have visual imaginary thoughts. Verbal are just words. They roll through your brain 
and you, you have an imaginary thought, and maybe you have this verbal thought about how you could hurt somebody who's hurt you. Someone offended you deep down, and uh, you know how, like, you're, you, you'll, you, I think everyone here knows what I'm talking about. You, you ever got into a heated conversation with someone, and you thought of the perfect comeback, but, like, after they were gone? You're like, oh man, I wish I could go get them. I have, the, I, I was shutting them down with this. That's a verbal imagination. It's a verbal imagination. You, you uh, listen to enough wicked music, and then you begin to think those lyrics through your head. That is a verbal imagination. How about visual though? Visual. How about a visual thought? So this is the one that is more prominent. You use our imagination and we visualize bad things. Before, uh, before the Stephen Paddock shot up Las Vegas just a couple of months ago, he had played this out in the theater of his mind over and over and over again. Before any school shooting takes place, and unfortunately there have been many school shootings, and one right down the road here in Newtown just a few years ago, before any of those school shootings take place, they are played out in the imagination, the visual imagination of the shooter over and over and over again. Before this individual took the truck and drove it down the walkway in New York uh, City just a couple of weeks back and then into the bus where, they, uh, where he injured two children severely, before that took place, uh, we know now that he had prepared this for a couple of years ahead of time in the imagination of the theater of his mind. He had pictured it. He had visualized how it would happen visual thoughts, and we think that nobody knows it is a place that is secret. It is a place that is secret. Number four, we see the sin that comes from our imagination. The sin that comes from our imagination. Can I just confess to you tonight that your pastor doesn't have this whole topic figured out yet? I don't have it all figured out yet. There are times my imaginations are sinful. I don't want anybody in here tonight to sit there and think, well, I've got this one licked. Truth is, probably very few of us have this one licked. You, uh, you ever have someone cut you off in traffic? What kind of imaginary thoughts do you have? You ever had a cashier be rude to you at the store? What kind of imaginary thoughts do you have? You ever had someone take advantage of you? You, you think to yourself, well, I'm going to get them back. The last time I checked, the Bible says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith, saith the Lord. The sin that comes from our imagination. Now, we're going to use our Bibles here, so get your Bibles out and get them ready to go. Letter A, we see vanity. Vanity. Turn over to Psalm chapter 2 and verse number 1. And uh, this is a, um, uh, I'm going to show you something in this verse that you maybe haven't seen before, if you haven't read it a particular way. Before we read it, you remember the illustration I used a couple weeks back where we talked about the 10% evil being over here. They're the ones pushing the, the, the wicked uh, immoral, uh, immorality on our country. Then you have the 10% over here. I believe this was on the hands that shed innocent blood sermon. And over here you have the 10% uh, uh, where uh, they're trying to pull the country in the right direction or pull the crowd in the right direction. And right in the 80, you have the middle, uh, in the, you have the 80% in the middle who are facing the wrong way, but they're just kind of going along through life and following the crowd. We get two of those three crowds mentioned right here in verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? That's this 10% over here. Notice this, and the people imagine a vain or an empty thing. This is the 80% here. The heathen are raging. Their imaginations are raging. They're wicked. They're evil. They're plotting. They're uh, divisive. They're, uh, they're coming up with devices so that they can lead people into greater sin. But then you have the people. The people, uh, the 80%, they're walking through life and they're just imagining a vain thing. They're just imagining vain. Turn over to Romans chapter 1 with me. We'll look at another example of this here. Romans chapter 1. This is a very dangerous place. Listen, the crowd over here, this 10% that it's pulling people in a wicked direction intentionally. At one point, they were here, thinking vain thoughts. Thinking vain thoughts. And they went through life just, just thinking about nothing and imagining nothing and doing it really well and being vain or empty in their thinking, shallow in their thinking, and eventually they landed over there. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 21. It says, Because that when they knew God, this is speaking about those who become homosexuals, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. So you see a downward trend here. They knew God. By the way, every atheist has a conversion date. 
Every one of them. You walk up to any atheist who just says, I'm an atheist, you say, when did you become an atheist? They all can tell you when. They may not be able to give you a date, they can give you an occasion. Why? They knew God, and then they chose to not believe in God. Look at the downward fall here. They uh, neither were thankful. They neither were thankful. So first they neglected God, they became secular. And then in their secular, uh, being secular, they began to be thankless. They began to complain all the time. They began to become covetous in their lifestyle. Look at the next step. But became vain or empty or godless in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened was darkened. And then the steps on downward into homosexuality. By the way, you don't find the word homosexuality in the King James Bible. In all many of the other versions, you find that word. The word homosexuality was invented, uh, I believe, about 120, 130 years ago, around the turn of the uh, 20th century there. And the reason why you don't find it in there is because it wasn't around in the 1600s when this was written. Instead, you find words like unnatural, inordinate affection, abusers of mankind. And I believe those are sodomites. Those are more accurate descriptions of what that is. And that is a more honest, uh, uh, more blunt uh, description of it. But how did this crowd get there? Because they were vain in their imaginations. We live in a country today where more people are vain in their imaginations than maybe you've ever lived at least in our country, have ever lived. We're becoming godless very quickly, which brings us to letter B, godlessness. Godlessness. Sins that come from our imaginations. Again, 33 out of 35 times that the word imagine is used. Imagine, imagine, imagination, imaginations. It appears to talk about these, these, these things, these thoughts, these uh, uh, pictures in our mind, these verbal imaginations being sinful. Why? Why? Because we are godless in our nature. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 24. Godlessness. This is the suppressing of the spirituality that God has put inside the heart of every single person. It says there, but they hearken not... Jeremiah 7, 24, but they hearkened not nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backwards and not forward. Now, there's an application here talking about the Israelites about backsliding, backsliding, being faithful to church and all of a sudden you're not, being faithful to God and your Bible reading and all of a sudden you're not. Uh, being faithful to living a, a, a moral life of integrity and Christian principles and all of a sudden you're not. Going backwards. How does that happen? Because the Bible says that, uh, that, that they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart. They instead followed the counsel that they were getting in their imagination. So it's one thing to lay yourself down and think, you know what, that guy, I can't believe he talked to me that way. I ought to go give him a piece of my mind. Now, that's an imagination. It's another thing to think that. It's another thing to obey that and go do it. That's a whole other level. You go from a vain thought to now you're living godless. You're getting the counsel of your own imaginations, and you've probably heard people say, well, I just speak my mind. Be careful. God gave you two, two ears and one, one mouth because he wants you to listen twice as much as you speak. Some people say, well, I just, I just put it out there and tell people how I feel. Be careful about that. Learn to find a stop sign somewhere between your brain and your tongue. And really, you need to learn to find a stop sign between your heart and your imaginations. And really, you need to find a stop sign between your eyes and ears and your heart. But at the very least, don't go and just say whatever you want to say to whoever you want to say it. Well, I gave them a piece of my mind. Is that really a Christ-like attitude? Is that really what, what Jesus would have you to do? What happens is you are obeying. You're coming under and you're living godless. You are obeying your own counsel. You're obeying the imaginations of your evil heart. These, um, these, these people we talked about that uh, shoot up, have shot up these different places, you know, the first time they imagined it, they probably shut it down pretty quick because it was a vain, sinful thought. And then they went a little bit longer. And they gave it a little more thought, a little more credence, a little more believability, and before you know it, before you know it, they are obeying 
the imaginations of the heart. They're doing it in a godless way. You remember in Judges, the Bible says every man did that which was right in his own eyes? You know what they were doing? They were obeying their, uh, their own imagination, and you ended up again with political anarchy like we talked about this morning. Let her see. The sins that come from our imagination, let her see. We see deceit. Deceit. Uh, Psalm 38, verse 12. It says this. They also, by the way, turn over Proverbs. Uh, uh, no, rather, turn over to Psalm 38, 12. Let me read for you Proverbs 12, 20. We've already looked at this one. It says, Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but the counselors of peace is joy. Psalm 38, verse 12. Turn over there with me, if you will. Psalm 38, verse 12. We see this concept of deceit working into our imaginations and the, the wicked imaginations of our heart, uh, as described in Proverbs 6. Psalm 38, verse 12 says, They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. They imagine deceits all the day long. Now, I think there's a couple of ways you can interpret that, imagine deceits. One, what they're imagining is deceit of how they can fool or hurt the psalmist, but I think another interpretation of this is that they are deceiving themselves by imagining these things. They're deceiving themselves. When you, uh, again, when you walk through life thinking that I can think whatever I want to, it's my mind, and I can uh, think whatever I want, no one's going to know, and, and, uh, and how can that hurt anybody if nobody knows? You, end up, you do end up becoming and practicing and putting into play those things which you imagine. If you can imagine great good for God, you're going to do great good for God. If you imagine great evil against other people or sin against other people or just uh, at the very uh, bare minimum vanity in your thoughts, that's what you're going to end up becoming. Garbage in, garbage out. Deceit, letter D, we see hate. Hate. Or you're in Psalm 38, right? Flip back over to Psalm chapter 10. Psalm chapter 10 should just be a few pages there. Psalm chapter 10 and verse 2. Look at the hate here in this verse. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. If you've been coming on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about how that the Israelites in the latter days before the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities, how that the court systems were swayed or slanted uh, toward the rich and the stealing away of property from the poor and the taking away of clothing from the poor and the stepping and walking all over the poor that took place there toward the end of the, the Hebrew reigns of, of Judah and Israel because they were persecuting the poor. Look there, it says, let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. When we were studying, uh, let's see, when we were studying the book of we're in Naaman, or we're in Naaman this week. It was uh, 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 what was the last book we were in? The book for Nahum is Obadiah, Obadiah, not Obadiah, Micah. Okay, we're in Micah. We're talking about it out of Micah. There's so many of them, you got to get them confused. Micah, Nahum, yeah. We're talking about in, in Micah how the Bible says they would sit on their bed at night and they would imagine ways to take advantage of the poor the next day. You remember Naboth? And Jezebel, or Naboth and Ahab and Jezebel, how that Ahab sat up on his bed at night and he stewed over how Naboth wouldn't give him the vineyard. And Ahab and Jezebel, before they went to bed that night, they devised a plan on how they would get the vineyard away from Naboth. And Jezebel went up and he made up allegations, she made up allegations against Naboth and had him murdered so that the field of the poor could be given to the king. That's hate, the oppressing of the poor. You say, Pastor, how does that apply to me? Listen, i, I got to say today that your attitude toward those who are on welfare, your attitude toward those that are the poor of our society, how is it tonight? How is it tonight? I, I have said this before, and, and, and it's a confession uh, that I've made before. I'll, I'll make it again here, is that for much of my adult life, up until just a few years ago, for much of my adult life, my attitude was, you homeless bum, go get a job. What are you doing standing on the street corner? How dare you act that way? And God has broken my heart over that. An attitude of persecuting or oppressing the poor. While that homeless man might need to go get a job, maybe he needs a Christian to come along and love him. Has that ever dawned on you the way it dawned on me? Maybe through love we can help teach that man integrity to go get a job and hold it down. Instead of throwing stones at him, remember that if you had walked in his shoes, you might be in the same place he is. Flip over to Psalm chapter 21, and verse number 11. And 
this is a psalmist talking about the evil, the wicked, and they're imagining toward God. It says, for they intended evil against thee, against thee, God. For they imagine a mischievous device which they are not able to perform. They literally sit around and think about ways that they would torture God if they could get their hands on it. I watched a, a clip some time back of a, some Christians who went into uh, a coffee bar. They were there drinking coffee. Christians. It was out in Washington State, I believe, somewhere out in the Northwest. And the man who owned the bar uh, was a homosexual man. Now, when the script is flipped and it's Christians that own and they don't serve the homosexuals, oh, we get lawsuits. But in this instance, Christians walked into a bar that was owned by a man who is knowingly gay. And they went in and they got their coffee and they sat down and they began to just converse about their time at church. And the man came out and began to throw all kinds of crazy, sickening blasphemy toward what he wants to do toward their God and how that they need to get out now. He expelled them from that place. They sit around and they devise evil in their heart against God. It's hate. It's hate. Now, again, uh, don't sit here and think, well, I would never do that. I hope you would never do that. But is there any va vanity in your imagination? Is there any revenge that's in your heart that is poking its head, head up and making its shape or frame in your imagination? If there's unconfessed sin, if there's past hurts, if there's, uh, if there's uh, uh, sinful habits, if there's that sin nature that you haven't tamed the way you ought to, then those evidences, that gauge, that thermostat is your imaginations. Number five, we see the sovereign who knows our imaginations. The sovereign who knows our imaginations. All right, turn over to Deuteronomy 31. If you haven't participated in all the Bible reading and you've been selective on it, everyone turn over to this one, please. Deuteronomy chapter 31. We're going to look at verses 19, 20, and 21. This is really, really interesting here. And uh, I, before, uh, before the studying of this message, I had never noticed this passage per se. It never leaped out to me. But this, is, um, this shows you just how well God knows the imagination, your imaginations, and this shows you how well God understands what harm that imagination is going to have on future generations. Look at verse 19. Now therefore, write ye this song for you, and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land, which I swear under their fathers that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves in wax and fat. Then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. So he says to, and we'll look at verse 21 in a minute here. He says to Moses, he says, teach the children of Israel this song. I'm going to give you a song. I want you to put it in their mouths and plant it down in their hearts so that they will teach it to their children. What's learned in song is learned long, Fanny Crosby said. And so I'm going to give you a song. I want you to teach them that they will sing to themselves in a few generations that will remind them of a lifestyle that is wicked that they're currently living. Now, here's where it hits home. Look at verse 21. And it shall come to pass... When many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as witnesses. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know currently, not I will know, I know their imaginations, imagination which they go about. Even now, even now, before I have brought them into the land which I swear. Here he's saying, I can already see the imagination of the heart now. And while they're not obeying it, while they're not following it, while they're not giving into it, it's already in their minds. And in a couple of generations, what is a dismissed imagination today will be an obeyed imagination tomorrow. When that happens, I want them to sing this song so that it will curse their very lifestyles. Now let's be honest with each other tonight. Let's be, let's be real and fair. You, you get up, you put on your nice clothes, the nicest clothes you have, many of you. Ladies, you get all dolled up with your makeup. You tuck that Bible under your arm just so. You push all the wrinkles out of your shirt, out of your dress, out of your skirt. You walk into church with a smile on your face. 
and you look the part. But how about on a Tuesday evening or a Thursday evening in the quiet of the moment when you're not at church? It's just you and that TV or you and that social media account or you and, uh, uh, you and, and your, uh, your, your binge watching of some show or uh, uh, you and all of that and then it's time to go to bed. And what you have put in your eyes and ears is now playing itself through your heart onto the screen of your imagination. God sees that. We can look the part at church, and I think you ought to look the part at church. This is not meant to be little that. Man sees the outside. You need to take care of the outside. But my friend, God sees the heart. God sees the heart. God said, I see the imaginations of this generation, and I know how this is the seed of corruption that will eventually hinder and hurt the following generations. If you're here and you're a parent or a grandparent, can I encourage you to keep your imaginations in line, your heart in line? If you can't, in its own way, it will hinder and hurt the next generations to come. All right, those are the five points. Let me give you three concluding thoughts to help give you something practical to live by this week. Don't you love it when the pastor says, do this, and you get good results? All right, here they are. Number one, we must cleanse our hearts. We must cleanse our our hearts. Again, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? This week when I was walking around the Chippeo property up in Vermont praying, I was uh, 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 thinking about this sermon. I was thinking about this truth. I was mulling over it. I was contemplating it. And I thought to myself, I don't even understand my own heart. I don't. I don't understand why I struggle with this sin or that sin. I don't understand uh, 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 the origin of it. I would love God to sit down and say, because this happened to you on this day of the history of your life as an eight-year-old boy, because of that event, you're now at 32, 33. I'm 33. I'm forgetting my age. At the age of 33, you're now struggling in this way. This incident back here as an eight-year-old boy is now causing you to struggle with behavior as a 33-year-old man. And this incident back here as a four-year-old boy is playing itself out in your life today in this way. And if you can go back and and you can deal with what happened to you as an eight-year-old boy or a four-year-old boy or a 16-year-old boy or a 20-year-old man, if you can get these things figured out, then that would help you to uh, get on the right path and not struggle with that anymore. Boy, I got to tell you, if I could have God sit down with me and explain all that out, how many would sign up for that in a heartbeat? Oh my goodness. But that's not going to happen. So you say, well, what can I do? You can, work at, you can work at cleansing your heart. You can work at pouring in God's word. You can work at begging God to show you, to show you what undealt with things are in your life. You know, there have been times in my heart where I thought I had forgiven somebody. And if you would ask me, have you forgiven them? I'd say, yes, I have. But then something will be said in a particular way or in a particular tone, and it pulls a trigger in my heart, and I realize I have not totally forgiven. And I've got to go back and I've got to deal with that so that my heart is cleansed and pure. Listen, you have no no chance of your imaginations being pure if your heart is remaining evil and undealt with. You've got to cleanse your heart. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How? By taking heed. That means that you're you're attentively paying attention to God's word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. I love Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And on down the list, list is, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, the much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. How about Joshua 1, eight? This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Meditate, dwell on, think on, chew on, uh, muse on, day and night, that uh, 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 this book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then Thou shalt make thy way prosperous. There's that word prosperous. 
then thou shalt have good success. Here's the idea. You've got to take God's word and you've got to pour it into it. God is sanctifying you. He's replacing, he's engrafting your word in where that sin was. It's a process. It's a process. Number two, concluding thought number two, we must guard our heart. We must guard our heart. I guess the most common verse we think of is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. How many ask this this evening? How many of you, Proverbs 4, 23 is your life's verse? Anybody here that way? Proverbs 4, 23 is your life's verse? That's a great verse. It's a common uh, life's verse for people. It, by the way, if you don't have a life's verse, get one. That, that's a great thing to have. And it can change from time to time, but get one and cling to it. What does that say? Keep thy heart with all diligence for out of the issues of life. Keep, guard, put a fence around, protect, preserve. Put a high fence or high wall around and guard it. Guard it. Watch tower it. Look over it. Watch for those hurts. Watch for those sinful habits developing. And like root, like weeds growing up in a garden that you're trying to keep just perfectly manicured and just right. You keep pulling those up as you see them and you deal with something as an issue. If I could use an analogy of um, going into uh, an old flower bed that's overgrown with weeds, the cleansing of the heart is the removing of the weeds. It is the turning over of the soil. It's even the pouring down of that new soil and putting in of those, uh, uh, those bulbs, those plants down into the ground. And it's the, it's the spraying the weed control on the t that and putting that plastic tarp down to help keep that suppressed. That's the cleansing of the heart, the pulling of the weeds of sin. But what can happen is, is that, have you ever done that where you cleaned out a flower bed and you got it all set up and then you turned around and left it? and you came back a year later, and you had to just basically start over? You ever had that happen to you or seen that happen to somebody? What do you got to do? Every day you got to go out, and you got to pull a little weed here, and pull a little weed there, and you pull a little weed here, and you pull another weed there. You see this, this weed that's growing up out of the bush, and if you don't uh, get it out, it's going to turn into a tree and take over the whole thing. And You get in there with a shovel and a spade, and you dig it up, and you get it out, and, and, and it's a lot easier to maintain than it is the initial cleaning. And tonight, what I'm here to tell you is that if you haven't already cleansed your heart, get down in the flower bed and pull the weeds out of your heart and cleanse the, the flower bed of your heart. But if you've done that, you've got to guard it. And it's a daily job. It's a, it's a regular job. It's even a moment-by-moment -moment job of pulling up the weeds, of putting that fence around, of keeping out the sin from your heart. You know, a good word for sin is subtle. It's subtle. Another good word for sin is that it's sneaky. It comes up on you and it takes over. That unconfessed sin will cut off your communication with heaven. Those past hurts and offenses can be picked up, be picked back up really easily. Guard your heart. Number three, and lastly, we must arrest and confess. We must arrest and confess. All right, one more verse here to have you turn to, and we'll be done. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Boy, this, uh, this, this one right here, this last concluding thought, this right here really can help you get over that hump of evil imaginations, of, of a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, as Proverbs 6 puts it. This can help you get over the hump. You think, Pastor, I just, I just can't seem to get my heart pure enough to matter, and every now and then I have an imagination that is filled with fear, an imagination that's filled with pride, or an imagination that's feared with, uh, filled with lust. I've got these imaginations that pop up, and Pastor, I'm trying, and I'm trying, and one will come out of nowhere. I don't even know where it came from. What do I do in that moment? Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of, God, knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What do you do? For someone who's getting over a uh, problem with alcoholism, you have done everything you can to pull the weeds and to put up the fence and to guard your heart. And then one day uh, you see a commercial or one day you hear somebody say something or you smell an odor that reminds you of the past and an imagination of alcohol pops up on your brain. Listen, this can happen to a 25 or 30 year recovered alcoholic. What do you do? You arrest and you confess. What do I mean by arrest? You slap, you slap proverbial handcuffs on that thought in your brain and you say, God, I'm turning this over to you. You're the authority. It's yours. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm sorry I did it. It's yours. I've put handcuffs on it. I'm not going to dwell on it. 
you're here tonight and you have a problem with uh, complaining or you have a problem with pride and you begin to get boastful and, 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 and well, look at the, the, uh, that lesson I taught. Wasn't it so great? That bus got filled up so big and full. Well, didn't I do a great job? And, and, and it, me, me, me. And, and you, you, you're trying to overcome that. You're doing everything you can and you're trying to become more humble in your approach. And you have that thought. Immediately you arrest and confess. You arrest and confess. You slap handcuffs on it and you say, God, I've arrested this. I've taken it into custody. It is yours. And I'm giving it over to you. I'm sorry I, I had that thought. And listen, you fill in the blank with whatever evil imagination that you think you cast that down. You arrest it and you confess it. You arrest it and you confess it. And what happens is that God looks down at you and he says, I don't hate you. You're not, a, you're not an abomination unto me. Because you're working to keep the weeds of sin out of your heart. God needs to see that in you. He needs to know that you're doing your best with that. How about it tonight, my friend? The Bible tells us that it is on the list, God's hate list, and a heart that imagineth evil, uh, a, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Is that something that you're struggling with? What is the condition of your heart? Let's have our heads about nice closed this evening. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you would stir within us Lord, I pray that you would put your finger on that area, that corner of our heart that's dark. Maybe that unconfessed sin that we're holding on to, that pet sin that we don't want to let go of, that excuse of a habitual sin that we don't want to deal with, that, that attitude of, of, of aloofness and coldness toward, toward, uh, toward you. Deal with that, Lord. Help our attitudes and our, our thought process to be in line. Because, God, if we can get the heart fixed, the seed of our imagination, then we can keep the images of our imagination pure. Lord, help us to deal with the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem being the problem with our hearts. Help us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. The altar's open. I would encourage you to come and kneel and pray and talk to the Lord about whatever it is God's dealing with you tonight. How about it, Christian? How's that heart of yours? Will you come down and kneel and talk to the Lord about it? Maybe it's not you that has the problem. Maybe it's a loved one that needs prayer. God sees your imaginations. It's a secret to you, but it's not a secret to Him. Are you arresting? Are you confessing? Still those making decisions down front. Let's continue to make decisions where we are. Cleanse the heart, guard the heart, and then arrest and confess. Say, Pastor, how do I cleanse my heart? Pour the Word of God in every way possible. Read it, study it, memorize it. Love it. Meditate on it. Dwell on it. Pour God's Word in your heart. Clean up that heart. Lord, thank you so much for this time in your word, this Bible study on the concept of our imagination, the theater screen of what's in our heart. May we be brutally honest with ourselves, God. May you search us, as the song said, and may you set us free. Thank you for 
your word. Thank you for the impact it made in me this week studying it. And I pray, God, it's something we would all strive to do better with. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, ushers, if you'll make your way forward at this time. Now just let me explain a little bit about what's been going on with, uh, with Miss Rose. Uh, she's not able to be here tonight. She just started a new job, and she got this job on Wednesday, and this is a job that's very vital to her well-being. And so she was not able to be here tonight. She wants to be here, wanted to be here, but can't be. For those of you that don't know, Rose has really gone through a, a lot of personal struggles over the last several months. Um, she has probably been admitted into the hospital for an overnight stay conservatively four times in the last six months, four times at least. Um, some of those were down in uh, the state of Pennsylvania where she was going to visit her daughter. She ended up uh, getting, I, th I don't even think it was her fault, she got in a really nasty accident and lost her car. She's, uh, for a while she was homeless, had nowhere to live. Uh, right now she's gotten a job as a, uh, uh, taking care of someone medically as a kind of a home health uh, agent thing and the, the job allows her to stay in that person's house. Prior to that, she was bouncing from location to location just looking for a place to live. Rose, no doubt, has a, a mountain of medical bills. And on top of this dark time in her life, really when she was just starting to get some good news about getting out of it, she finds out that her daughter's been murdered in, down in Pennsylvania last Sunday, brutally murdered. Um, this is a time for us to step up and love each other. You say, Pastor, how is the money going to be handled? The money is going to be put uh, into a specific uh, allotted account of our benevolence fund under Rose's name, and uh, the deacons and I will work carefully to help Rose to know how to use this money to uh, better her lifestyle and her living. Uh, paying off uh, bills that we see that she has that she can't get around, helping her get back on her feet, and then obviously paying for any funeral expenses that uh, she has. Now, they have chose to cremate the body. Originally, they were talking about uh, having a regular funeral that would have cost around $11,000. So, because of the cremation, it's brought the price way down, but there's still going to be expenses. The funeral home doesn't do these services for free, so there are still going to be expenses. And so, if you can reach past uh, the ones and the fives and the tens and the twenties in your wallet tonight, and give according to what uh, God's given you in your abundance and be a blessing to her. We promise that we're going to use this money to really, truly help Rose and be a comfort uh, to her. So do your part. The other thing you can do is Tuesday at 10 o'clock, if your schedule allows it, be here to support her uh, as we um, celebrate the life of her daughter. And then if you can help prepare food for that, you can see my wife, again, an Italian-based theme. So we'll pray at this time, and then we'll collect an offering uh, uh, in, in, uh, in regards to these things. Let's pray. Lord, help us tonight as we show love toward a sister, uh, a sister who's struggling. Lord, a sister who's been a part of this church for many, many years. May we, um, may we represent our church well in helping her. And Lord, as you've given in our, to us abundantly, may we give back to those that are uh, hurting and weak during it this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand to our feet. Why don't we finish tonight the way we began the service. Let's sing I Love You, Lord, one more time. And we'll sing it a cappella. Sing it out from your heart. If you know a harmony part, feel free to sing that. Ready? Here we go. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship.
Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I hope that song came from your heart. I hope that was a song of devotion between you and your God. And teens, you have a good time upstairs tonight enjoying the ice cream. Some of the adults might end up crashing your party. You better hurry up and get up there. Amen. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Brother Verone, if you would, close us in prayer.